All right, I'm going to get started here. Um, hopefully it won't be too loud out there. Uh, so my name is George Reese. I'm here to talk about uh, the OpenStack APIs, uh, both from a perspective of you know, what uh, exist out there uh, with the OpenStack APIs, uh, how you approach them as a developer, and get into some critiques uh, of the APIs as well. Uh, I'm also going to close out the, the conversation to touch on the whole OpenStack versus EC2 APIs that people seem to like to fight a lot about. So my background is, yeah, first off, I, I was the former CTO of Instratius, which was acquired by Dell about six months ago. Uh, and uh, in my role over the last six years of building out in Stratius, I've you know, built out the open source Java Cloud Abstraction API, uh, Design Cloud, which uh, what it f does basically is provide a single uh, Java interface that talks to all the different clouds out there, and there's support for like two dozen different clouds. So in terms of you know, working with cloud APIs, whether they're RESTful, whether they're SOAP, whether they pretend to be RESTful. Um, I, I, you know, I, I've done a heck of a lot of it. Uh, in addition to that, I'm very opinionated on the whole REST API thing and eventually got so sick w uh, with the state of REST APIs that I wrote a book on it. Uh, it's five bucks on Amazon, it's an ebook, but if you want, if you go to the Dell booth, they have little USB sticks that have the PDF of the book on it, so you can get it for free uh, here. Um, when I say I'm a general critic of the OpenStack APIs, I mean that not in the pejorative sense, uh, I mean it in the sense, so I'm not, I'm not out there throwing tomatoes at the OpenStack developers. I actually am trying to help improve uh, uh, the state of OpenStack APIs. And perhaps as I get into some of the more critical comments in this uh, talk, it is important to, to keep in mind that I do think that the OpenStack APIs are some of the best uh, architected APIs in the cloud computing world. I, I can't think of anything that's a close second from API design. Uh, now that's a very low bar. There are some really bad APIs out there in the cloud world, uh, not the least of which is Amazon's APIs. Uh, but uh, there's a lot more to an API than being elegantly designed, and I'm going to talk a lot to that particular issue as, as we go into this. And when I'm a, and as a critic of the APIs, my objective is to improve those APIs. Um, when I was, you know, when we were in Stratius, we were not aligned with anybody, so I would, you know, so I throw, and even now at Dell, I just throw tomatoes randomly, uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I crit criticize everybody equally out there in the API space. Uh, um, with Dell, we're obviously behind OpenStack, and so obviously that criticism comes with love. Uh, <laughs> But um, you, to, to understand any criticisms I have, you, you sort of have to agree with this basic premise that, that I hold around RESTful APIs. And that um, obviously, you know, first and foremost, they need to expose the underlying functionality of the system they're supporting. So in the case of OpenStack, that means Anything that you should want to be, do as a, to be able to do as a third party, you should be able to achieve that through the APIs alone. And uh, you should not have OpenStack developers sitting in judgment over your use cases and say, well, you shouldn't be wanting to do that. Uh, but more than anything else, and, and, and this is super important, is that it should be based on abstractions that hide the implementation of the underlying thing that you're trying to access. And uh, any changes to that underlying thing should never, ever, ever result in breaking client code. Now, a lot of us may be used to coming from worlds like Java APIs or .NET APIs or C libraries or whatever, where you version things and then you say, okay, I'm deprecating this and moving on with life. That can't work. That model doesn't work with REST APIs. Uh, 
and, and to um, you know, put it in, in uh, a fine point on it, I guess, is that with Amazon, I have never had code that I've written break because of an EC2 or S3 or whatever upgrade. The, so I have code that I wrote in 2007 that works today against EC2. I, I doubt I have code from 2011 that still works against OpenStack. So I'll start off talking about what the OpenStack APIs, how they're structured, uh, before I get into to, you know, to some of the nitty gritty. Um, the first thing to, to keep in mind is that it's not the OpenStack API. There is no OpenStack API, just like there's no Amazon API. Uh, instead, and this is a good thing, uh, it is a suite of APIs. So an API for accessing Keystone, Nova, Cinder, all those different things. Uh, it allows the APIs and the services they represent to vary independently and and if clients are written in a proper way, they should be tolerant of those variances. Uh, and you know, again, you've seen it successfully done with Amazon. Um, you know, you look at competing products out there beyond Amazon and and, uh, and and OpenStack, and a lot of them have a monolithic API, and that creates a heck of a lot of problems uh, as you try to you know scale the product and scale the API. Uh, it is one of the most faithful APIs, or the, the whole set of them are, are one of the most faithful sets of APIs out there in the cloud computing sets, uh, space uh, with respect to um, RESTful principles. And what I mean by that is uh, that you know, it's, it's fully HTTP based using the HTTP verbs in the way they're specified uh, in the HTTP specification. There's not a lot of making up custom HTTP status codes. Uh, you know, if, uh, for example, uh, CloudStack, uh, to, to pick on somebody that irritates the hell out of me on this uh, particular uh, topic, um, you know, whenever, if you submit something wrong, you'll get a 531 or something like that. So not only is it a completely made up error code, it's not even in the right uh, HTTP status class for user submission, bad submission data. Uh, another thing that I really like about the way OpenStack does things is that it supports both JSON and XML. And that is not without a huge amount of fighting on occasion on my part with uh, the, the mailing list. Um, there, there's, a, there's definitely a bias among the developers to support JSON. Uh, if any of y'all have read the, my REST book, uh, I have a whole section on uh, you know, JSON versus XML, and my philosophy on that is that you should support both. Uh, because when you pick one or the other, you start judging uh, people's use cases. Because it turns out XML in, in enterprises, people have a heck of a lot of tooling built around XML stuff. And so when you go in with your API that's aimed at the enterprise and say, you need to build you know, all those tools you've already got, well, you need to retool them for JSON. That doesn't work so well uh, with the enterprise. But on, this, on, the, on the same uh, note, if you go into a, you know, a, a more modern set of developers and say, oh, yeah, you have to start parsing XML again, they'll throw you out. <laughs> so uh, you know, OpenStack does a great thing by supporting both. And the whole API uh, suite gets started with Keystone. You cannot, uh, no matter what a given install, and there's a big asterisk that's going to come a little bit later on this, but in general, any install you have is going to start with Keystone, and you need to interact with Keystone to do just about anything. Certainly uh, authenticate, but also if you're going to build a client in a proper way that is going to discover an infrastructure, you also need to know, uh, understand the service catalog nature of Keystone. And, and so, uh, as a service catalog, uh, you can write a client that will talk to, your open, to two different OpenStack environments and will automatically discover what the, the, the difference is between those two OpenStack environments. Uh, because I promise you there are not two OpenStack environments on Earth that are alike. 
and, um, and, and so you need that programmatic discoverability of your OpenStack infrastructure. If you contrast that with something like the, the EC2 APIs that don't have a service catalog, uh, knowing um, unless you build special voodoo logic into your code, uh, um, you don't know the difference between a eucalyptus environment and an EC2, uh, true EC2, and an OpenStack environment with the EC2 APIs. You, ha you have to write this voodoo code and, and then uh, cache that information about what cloud you're actually dealing with. Keystone, no voodoo, you just discover it and do whatever you need to do. And then, of course, Keystone is an identity authentication service that acts as a secure token uh, service, not something, I don't like secure tokens for uh, APIs of this nature, but it is the least of my criticisms of uh, OpenStack APIs. So once you've authenticated with Keystone, you can then go out to any of the other services. Now, You've generally queried the service catalog and you know what services that, uh, that are being supported in this OpenStack environment. And you know they run the gamut from the standard Swift, Nova, Glance, Cinder, Neutron. Um, actually, that's probably not the best way to put Nova. Nova plus extensions, you don't really get to discover. You get to discover that there's Nova and you have, no abs you have absolutely no clue whether there are any extensions in there or not. Uh, and that's an artifact of the way, uh, you know, uh, the OpenStack reality was pre-Keystone. Uh, then at the bottom, there are custom services there. That's really important. So in an OpenStack install, you can go and stick in your own whatever is a service, register it with, uh, uh, with Keystone, and any client will see, oh, there's this whatever is a service thing in there. And if it knows how to interact with whatever is a service, it'll do so. If it doesn't, it'll just ignore that service and deal with the things it understands. So um, go into a little bit of detail here on how uh, Keystone actually the authentication process works because that's really important to understanding everything else that I'm going to go into here. First is, uh, you know, authentication is really simple. You post a, a JSON or XML payload that includes uh, the username, password, uh, authentication model into Keystone, and then Keystone's going to give you back a nice little token. Uh, you can then use that token when you're making calls against any service, and the service then checks the token with Keystone to, to verify that you are actually supposed to be doing what you're, you're doing. Uh, so, you know, going back to the token thing, I don't like these token-based approaches because uh, when you're dealing with clouds that are installed behind the firewall, people very often don't ins install proper signed certificates, so you end up with not really being able to trust the communication model. The virtue of the way EC2 does authentication is you can actually run EC2 over plain text and you'll have a, a secure interaction with the server. You don't need SSL. With OpenStack, you not only need SSL, but you need SSL with a trusted uh, SSL certificate. So that means either signed by a trusted third party or self-signed with the trust you know, pushed out to the clients. The problem with REST APIs is that pushing uh, that the trust for the self-signed certificate is not very scalable. So in general, I like my APIs to be able to run over plain text because of the realities of what happens behind the firewall, uh, but it is a very minor nit in the scheme of things. Um, once you have the token, you need to cache that token, uh, and then you will, as I said earlier, you will use it when you're fetching servers from Nova. You'll, you'll include it in the uh, header as X auth token header. Uh, same with any other service out there. Uh, but with the one caveat that you always need to be prepared to re-authenticate because it is valid for, uh, for, for any uh, OpenStack service to say, 
you need to re-authenticate again because the token's expired or you know, somebody's gone in there and manually forced the issue or whatever. Uh, so your logic not only needs to be able to ha handle a proper 200, 202, or whatever response, but it also needs to be able to say, oh, I need to re-authenticate and then reissue uh, whatever query or, or post or whatever I was doing. So the things that suck here. Uh, first is there's no standard payload. I, I'll real quick bring up uh, the... You notice here I've got this auth racks ks key colon API key credentials. That is uh, one of the ways in which Rackspace allows you to authenticate with their cloud. Um, on the other hand, uh, Ra HP has a different mechanism. Uh, other uh, installs have yet another mechanism for authenticating. Uh, and the, the other is the one that particularly bothers me because it's username and password. And so you are, um, uh, you know, compounding what I consider the weakness of STS with the weakness of username and password credentials. And that is sort of the standard within OpenStack. And, uh, and so you've got all the problems associated with username and password authentication. But, the, but as a client, I really can't know when I go into an environment what kind of authentication that environment uh, expects. So I end up having to write some voodoo logic to say, is this HP, is this Rackspace, is this some sort of custom environment? Oops, I've been installed in yet another environment I haven't uh, encountered before, so I need to write some new logic to deal with that. And then another thing is sometimes you need a tenant ID uh, and sometimes you don't. And sometimes you need a tenant name instead of a tenant ID. So, and there, again, there's no magic way to deal with that. Um, you know, I get people actually within the OpenStack development community that insists, no, it's always one way or another, but uh, just between HP and Rackspace, it's different. <laughs> the other thing is that Keystone, you know, maybe if all you care about is, S or not even SX, if you care about, let's say, Grizzly and beyond, then this slide probably doesn't matter that much to you. Um, Dasein Cloud and, and Stratius Dell Multi Cloud Manager care about Bear, Cactus, Diablo, SX, Folsom, Grizzly, Havana, and Ice House. And so we actually we have to deal with environments that don't have Keystone. That's a minor problem. It means that uh, you know code that was written against Bear no longer works when Keystone's in play. So that's breaking one of my, you know my primary uh, rules. Uh, uh, but you know that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is there's no way to tell uh, without doing a lot of bad things, or not bad, but not good things, like um, which I, I allude to at the bottom there, to, to go and figure out what kind of environment I'm dealing with. It's, and it's not even as simple as saying, OK, do I have Diablo or do I have Essex? I've got Folsom environments that don't have Keystone against them. Um, it's because during Essex and Folsom, people screwed around with their configurations in really horrible ways and, and actually mixed uh, Essex, Folsom, and Diablo code into one sort of uh, monster OpenStack environment. So my trick to, uh, to, to, to programmatically discover this stuff is if the endpoint ends with 1 or 1.1, try the Nova authentication first. Then if that fails, try Keystone. Otherwise, I'll try Keystone first, then Nova. And it's assumed to be a failed authentication if both don't uh, work. And ideally, you're caching tokens, so you don't have to worry about doing that over and over and over again. Yeah? What's that? Um, I'm not aware of any, but I haven't tried yet. <laughs> oh, the question was, are we expecting any changes in 3.0? So versioning. Uh, so how the versioning ne uh, negotiation works is that, um, now the good thing is, is that services are versioned independently, just like they are with, uh, in the EC2 APIs. Uh, and so when you go and query a uh, service catalog, you get 
all the versions of the Nova APIs that are supported, and then uh, you can uh, pick an endpoint that supports uh, the version of the API you understand as a client. Uh, and that, you know, that's a very good and useful way to do version negotiation. Uh, and then you, know, you make the calls against that endpoint and it responds in a manner consistent with the way uh, that version of that service worked. Uh, and, then, um, and then you can you know, use things the way you expect them. Now, um, the reality is, is that it's, it doesn't work that cleanly. It's actually horrid. And one of the things I'll say on Twitter a lot of times is that OpenStack isn't even compatible with itself. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, um, you know, ideally, Keystone uh, you know, should be standardized across installations, uh, and it should you know, give you the authority on everything that's going on in that environment. Uh, as I mentioned, older versions of Keystone are a mess, in turn, including the ability to determine you know, whether or not you even have Keystone. Uh, and um, you know, the, 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 the other, the biggest problem actually is this thing, the, the, the issue that the same service can have different identities uh, within uh, uh, Keystone. And, and a lot of that has to do with the way new you know, uh, new services get built out in the OpenStack development process. And I'll talk more in about that when I get into Neutron and Cinder uh, in a little bit. What's that? Um, Keystone is its own independent service and can be installed on its own, as far as I understand it, its own node or on a node with other things. I'm not an, an OpenStack architecture person, though. But it is where all services get registered and where all authentication happens. So, uh, talk about core Nova extensions and the custom services now. So, um, so supposedly OpenStack supports a core uh, set of APIs with the ability to easily integrate APIs in support of non-core services. This is not at all the way things end up working in, in the wild. Um, it you know has its core you know set of APIs. It uh, and you know you have the non-core services. A good ex real example of whatever is a service is something like DNS as a service, like you know Rackspace, uh, you know Cloud DNS, or uh, you know database as a service, like with the HP database as a service. Um, but when you try to actually build a system that can tell can actually navigate an OpenStack environment uh, without having to know a heck of a lot ahead of time about that environment, and then survive upgrades as time goes on. It just, it's, it's not possible, uh, it hasn't been possible at least uh, through uh, Havana. So here's an example of a core API. So we got Nova, and don't worry if you can't read the actual code here. I, I called out a couple of important things. So you've got the catalog entry. So when you authenticate, you get your service catalog, and if you're going against Rackspace like this one is here, you'll get a catalog entry for cloud servers. Uh, and you know, and this is you know one that supports version 1.0 of the uh, the uh, Nova APIs, and so at that moment, uh, if I've got a piece of of, of you know, Dasein Cloud code or some Python code that's talking to OpenStack or whatever, I can tell, I can start listing servers, provisioning servers, all that sort of stuff just based on that catalog entry. And the key thing there is the type, compute. I know that because I have a type compute that this is Nova that I'm talking to essentially. Then I'll go out to Nova and make this request response. Uh, notice that the endpoint here is slash server slash detail. Um, you know, don't get hung up on the slash detail bit. That's a little bit of a, 
bizarreness that goes back to uh, Rackspace API days. Uh, one of the, the things I don't like, but uh, <laughs> um, but the bottom line is, is you got the servers endpoint that you could go and, and grab servers information, and then you know, and, and then in the payload that I get back from Rackspace is a servers uh, data element. So here's a non-core API example of cloud DNS. So in this case, my type is racks colon DNS. Now, if, I don't, if my code doesn't deal with DNS as a service, uh, then I just ignore this catalog entry. If my code is designed to work with HP's DNS as a service, I just ignore this entry. Uh, if with Dasein Cloud, uh, for example, I need to work with both, I know that since this is Rack's DNS, the, the APIs I'm going to use to talk for DNS purposes are going to be the Rackspace DNS as a service and not the HP ones. So again, you know, the request response, I go against slash domains and I get a, a data element back there that's uh, domains for the list of domains that are in there. So here's where things start to get ugly, Nova volumes. Uh, and this, this stuff really irritated the heck out of me when the whole Nova volumes to sender uh, migration was occurring. So you'll notice here, first off, there's no catalog entry. So that means that my code cannot know ahead of time whether or not I am dealing with Nova volumes. I can make the assumption that if I've got sender in the, in the service catalog, that I probably don't need to worry about Nova volumes. Uh, but other than that one assumption, if I don't see sender in the service catalog, I could either be dealing with an environment that supports Nova volumes, or I could be dealing with an environment that just doesn't have Nova volumes turns on, or it could be one that predates uh, Nova volumes. I don't know which. And the endpoint here is OS slash, OS dash volumes, not volumes. Uh, the response still has volumes, however, as the data element. So during the Nova volumes to sender migration, uh, uh, and, uh, real quick, under sender, sender's a, a core API, so it, uh, it, it has a catalog entry, and uh, by the way, the request is slash volumes, not slash, uh, slash OS dash volumes. So, so um, first, First and foremost, the problem here is that uh, the APIs exposed the fact of how volumes were being treated under the covers of Nova volumes versus uh, Cinder. You don't care about that as a developer. You should not care. I mean, the, the, IPs, the APIs actually between Nova volumes and, and Cinder are very close to identical. That's the even more maddening thing. All you have to do is essentially change OS-volumes to volumes, and voila, you've got code that's working against sender. Uh, but again, uh, because of the way uh, this, the, the implementation has been exposed, uh, you have to go and discover that on your own. And if you were in an environment that upgraded from Nova volumes to sender, your code probably broke unless you did some bizarre pinging for you know, invalid endpoints to determine uh, what was going on. Uh, and um, you know, so that's that's one problem. Things are much worse with with Neutron. I referred to it uh, time and time again as Frank Franken quantum. Uh, that's because um, it's not it's you know with Cinder you had either you have Cinder you have Nova volumes or you have nothing. With uh, Neutron you've got uh, you've you've got nothing potentially, you've got Nova Networks potentially, you've got some nonsense that Rackspace put out there, uh, and then you've got standard straight out Neutron. And so, you know, to start off with, um, you know, the, here's some example of, of, of the most innocuous code to deal with that in Dasein Cloud, and this is where we determine what endpoint we're going against. So if we're, 
quantum, we're going against slash networks, standard core API thing. Uh, if it's rack space, we're going against os-networks v2. And if we're going against uh, Nova networks, it's os-networks. Turns out that actually to make this all programmatically work without us having to do a lot of ahead of time configuration, there's a lot more ugly code that I didn't decide to expose here uh, that actually goes out to, to the, uh, you know, and navigates the service catalog, goes out, and then starts hitting endpoints and guessing which one it might be, uh, and then eventually figures it out. So, you know, that, that's the bulk of, you know, the structure of the OpenStack APIs, uh, the good and the bad along with it. Before I go into, you know, the API war and EC2 versus OpenStack stuff, you know, the important thing is, is that these aren't things about that are inherent in the API that are problematic. It's just stuff that's inherent in the way we roll out changes and manage change within the OpenStack community that create these problems. Uh, the, there is no need for these problems ever to arise, and so we can address them without having to re-architect an API. The same can't be said for the cloud stack APIs. To fix everything that's wrong with the cloud stack APIs, you have to go in and re-architect uh, the, the entire set of cloud stack APIs. And you know, you know, hope, you know, with the vCloud APIs, you just want to blow them up. So, um, so start off with facts. So the facts about the AWS APIs, and the most important one up here is that AWS, regardless of anything else you want to say about those APIs, has a huge ecosystem of, uh, of code built around uh, those APIs. Uh, you know, and you know, the reality out there in, in the real world is most people who are doing any kind of public, or any type of cloud computing are in some way or another dealing with OpenStack and have, you know, I mean, with AWS and are, and, and are starting, and, and starting to build internal tools around the way they're using EC2 in addition to all the public, you know, open source and commercial tools that are, that are built around it. As I mentioned earlier, AWS has never, to my knowledge, broken people's uh, uh, correctly written uh, code. And actually, AWS is really smart uh, about uh, doing things that even deal with people's improperly written code. Um, I'll deal with uh, an example down at the bottom there, but uh, um, another interesting thing about the S3 APIs in particular is just about every cloud storage solution out there has a Amazon S3 API support. So if you've got a tool that's written against S3, uh, you can talk to a, a number of, uh, of, of cloud storage vendors, both for private cloud and public cloud storage. Uh, some things that, that start to cause problems, though, are first off, uh, the, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's very opinionated on how it models cloud. Um, when, it, um, when it comes to being somebody else who's trying to model cloud and solve cloud from a different perspective, though, that opinionated uh, viewpoint becomes a problem. It's not a problem for S3 because cloud storage is cloud storage and that's that. It does get to be a problem. It's not a problem for Eucalyptus because Eucalyptus is trying to model cloud the way Amazon models cloud. It is a problem for OpenStack because OpenStack is not trying to model cloud computing the way Amazon does. And so um, when you look at Amazon from a, a EC2 perspective, you are limiting the perspective that people can get of what's in an OpenStack environment. It's, it's a god-awful API. Uh, it, it's not a RESTful API, it's, and they don't even call it that. It's, a, it's the EC2 query APIs, or if you're really uh, up for punishment, you can use the SOAP APIs. Uh, it, it's, it's also, 
co complex to mimic in a transparent manner. And going back to the point I made earlier about not breaking code, a good example of that is a lot of clients out there actually violate the EC2 documents and, and present time formats in ways that aren't, that aren't documented in the EC2 APIs. And Amazon actually honors those uh, invalid date formats. And then somebody else comes along and uh, implements an EC2 compatible API that is perfect according to the documentation, and these clients suddenly don't work against it because it's expecting date uh, timestamps in, in the way that Amazon documented them, but the, the ecosystem is using different uh, 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 one. Also, how Amazon does a terrible job with ident resource identifiers across the board, uh, and uh, that terrible way in which they do it ends up leaking into uh, people who try to, to build compatible APIs, especially ones that are designed to have globally unique identifiers like uh, OpenStack. OpenStack APIs, on the other hand, are elegant, largely consistent with each other, even every, aside from everything I said, the OpenStack APIs really are very consistent. Um, they have, OpenStack APIs have a decent level of ecosystem support, but as much as we like to talk about all the stuff we're doing here against OpenStack in this community, it dwarfs in comparison to what EC2 has out there. Uh, on the now downside, as I mentioned earlier, it's constantly breaking existing code, um, but it's controlled by the OpenStack community, which gives us the power to properly model OpenStack concepts. And where this becomes a real problem, you know, a lot of people say, well, Amazon's done everything the right way, so why don't we follow that model? It starts to fall apart when it comes to networking. A EC2 networking is is, is horribly modeled. And it's reflected in the VPC APIs and the other APIs for interacting with, with networking. We do not want Neutron to look like the EC2 networking APIs. So, um, so the control we have lets us model networking better and uh, provide uh, programmatic access into that model appropriate to, 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 to the OpenStack model. So, from my perspective, we actually need to support both APIs. Um, even, and, and that's a lot of work, especially because of all the nuances of Amazon supporting things that aren't documented in those APIs. Um, but for a certain, we can, this means that we can take an OpenStack uh, environment, put it into a company that is using AWS that needs to do a private cloud infrastructure, and their existing tools can start leveraging OpenStack. Their new tools may use the OpenStack APIs. They may not be able to get access to some of the superior ways that you know, OpenStack is doing networking, whatever, but they can leverage their existing tools to get started, and the biggest problem the OpenStack community has is people have a hard time getting started. Um, but the OpenStack APIs have to be there. We cannot just defer our modeling to, to, to Amazon. And you know, Quant or Net Neutron being the best example. But anywhere we are innovating about how cloud should be abstracted, uh, we need control over the end API model. And the OpenStack APIs give us that. So I've got about two minutes, 20 seconds for questions. Uh, any? Yeah? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, so so anybody with that token now be able, becomes able to do anything that that user is able to do within any uh, OpenStack service. So if if you were to put that communication channel over non-SSL, it would be easy to sniff that token and then start doing nefarious things. Uh, whereas with an Am Amazon does request signing, so you never pass the secret across the wire. Um, so, so your, your 
it requires HTTPS with trusted certificates. So yeah, the, the trusted certificates aren't there for the authentication process. It's to trust the channel that the authentication is occurring over. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why I, so the question is, is this going to get better or worse with scale? If we don't address the problem, it'll get worse. Uh, and, and, you know, we don't have, you know, even for, you know, the clouds that we're interacting with at this time, you know, the ability to move the same code from cloud to cloud to cloud without a bunch of configuration is problematic. If we had uh, to be able to support, you know, 200 arbitrary clouds, then it becomes a problem. And that's why we have to address this compatibility issue now. Um, okay, 30 seconds. Yeah. So, can you give me a specific example of security plan support with the OpenStack API that you can support with Amazon Um, Anything that you can support with, EC, with OpenStack that you can't support in Amazon? Um, well, I can't think of a good example of that, um, but uh, you, cannot, you cannot describe the Neutron. Uh, networking model in the way it, it, using the Amazon EC2 APIs, at least not in a natural way. And, and similarly, you could not express Amazon's networking uh, using the Neutron APIs. That, that would be my best example, but it's kind of weak. Uh, I'm out of time, but you can ask questions uh, afterwards. Thanks. <laughs>